I've had the pleasure to be involved in education reform for about 15 years in a variety of different roles. But I can tell you that it's been my role as a mother of two, one of whom has special needs, and also my vice chairmanship on our State Developmental Disabilities Council that has really guided me to a more laser-like focus on special ed. And I'm excited that we have such a great panel here. We have Senator Andy Gardner from Florida, who's gonna tell us a little bit about his journey in sponsoring some groundbreaking legislation. And we're, our hope, of course, is that you leave this session maybe a little bit more excited about special education reform and allow, as well as some concrete ideas on how to take it back to your state. We also have Tennessee Commissioner of Education, Kevin Huffman. He is working on all kinds of great things like uh, evaluation reform and making sure that special education teachers are meaningfully included, as well as big changes in policies, I believe, to their alternative testing program. And we have Dr. Matthew Ladner with us from the foundation. He is going to share some insight with us on really how well our special education students are faring academically as well as some of the opportunities that our special education students have in some other states. But before we get started, we wanted to share a little bit of data with you. What you'll see here is just a snapshot of the special education population in our country by category in 2011. Now one of the things, if you've never taken time to look at this data that may strike you is the wide variety and diversity of needs. But one of the reasons that we wanted to share this data is because we wanted to use it to set the stage that the one thing that all of these students, all of our students have in common is that they all deserve limitless opportunities, great expectations, and great teachers. The second slide just shows you the same data, but in a different format, and it's meant to highlight the fact that, again, although there's great diversity of needs within our special education population, almost 60% of the population is comprised of two large categories, one of which is specific learning disabilities, and in that category, you may have students with dyslexia, dysgraphia, some other types of issues, and then the second largest is speech language impairment, which is a, a big interest of, for me because in, Speech and language acquisition is a building block to reading. It's a building block to phonics. So when we're thinking about K-3 reading initiatives, to me, thinking about speech and language acquisition has got to be a, a really good component of that. Now, without any further delay, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Senator Gardner and tell us a little bit about his story. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for, for being with us today. Um, it's, is it on? No, it's on. Oh. A little bit of blowback, a little bit. I'll keep talking. Okay. Um, it, it, it's a real honor to be here. Just a little bit of background on me. I uh, was first elected to the Florida House of Representatives back in 2000. And if you remember back in 2000, we had a little voting issue um, in Florida. Um, it turned out the right way, in my opinion. But it really, there was a reason I wanted to come to the Florida House, and that was to be a part of the Jeb Bush revolution. Uh, Governor Bush was elected in 1998. I was 30 at the time and was part of the largest freshman class to come into the, to the Florida House. Um, it was in many ways because we just wanted to be a part of what Governor Bush was doing. The topic before us today, that journey, uh, started while I was in the Florida House 10 years ago when uh, our first child, Andrew, was born with Down syndrome. And uh, Carla and I were just talking about it. We didn't know uh, at the time when Andrew was born. Um, uh, within an hour, uh, you're told of, of the situation. But then, you know, in our particular case, our son had a, a heart defect. And we're told, um, obviously, some things that were very stressful. So uh, it started us on a journey. And it started us meeting other parents and other families uh, of children uh, with the same, uh, I like to say, unique ability and also uh, children uh, with autism and others. And it really put me in a situation as a member of the legislature to think about that population and what are we doing and what could we do better. And over that time, we've done a lot of different pieces of legislation um, that have, I think, started to level the playing field. But in Florida, the one thing we came to the table with is that under Governor Bush, especially, we were very good about early intervention, speech therapy, occupational therapy, funding those programs. But what we found is now those children were getting to the age where they, they wanted to go to school. 
They wanted to be included. They wanted to be a part of a regular classroom. And then ultimately, the challenge that we're going to face now, and we can talk about this a little bit, is now those kids are, are ready to move on and, and actually go to post-secondary in some capacity. Some of the legislation we've done this last year, I think, was probably one of the, the, the best years for us, in particular dealing with the IEP. And if you're familiar with the IEP, that is essentially your negotiation with the school district on how you're going to educate your child. And for those of us that have resources, it can be, uh, it's almost like lawyer, lawyering up uh, as you're going through the process. But as Governor Bush mentioned in his opening speech, you have to think about that single mom that may be working full time and their only interaction on how their child with a unique ability is going to be educated is through the IEP process. In Florida, we had examples where uh, the child was um, essentially, well, we'll get into inclusion in a minute, but was taken off a regular diploma track and put on a special diploma, and the parent never even notified, the parent never being able to be a part of that discussion. So this year, um, with legislation that we, we sponsored, I actually have two of my, my good friends and colleagues, Senator Stargell and Senator Galvano here, we passed legislation that says in the IEP process, it is empowering the parent. It says that you cannot make a decision on how you're going to educate my child unless I sign off on it. And at the end of the process, the parent has to, and the, and the administration have to sign a, a mutual document that yes, we both are in agreement that this is the best education plan for our child. The other piece that was um, a little bit of a challenge that we would hear from parents is that their local school, they would take their child with a particular um, ability, take them to that school, and the school would say, we can't, you know, we don't have the, f the financial resources to, to help your child here. We want to send them to another location. We put in there that now the parent will know, when they go into the IEP, exactly how much money is available to help with speech therapy, occupational therapy, and other therapies so that the, the child just couldn't be pushed into another location. The, the goal was to have that child in that particular location. A couple of other things that we put in that bill, we realized that nowhere in, in at least Florida statute, I don't even think anywhere else in the, we're getting there. I'll start singing it, that'll help. Uh, one thing that we found in, in Florida is that we don't have a definition, and we didn't at the time, of what inclusion was. Every school district and every school had a different definition of what inclusion was for a, a child with a disability. Some areas it was, well, the, the child goes to the local school, they're in a, um, a, a different classroom, and then we bring them in for art, or we bring them in for PE, and then we send them back to the other classroom. We now in Florida have a definition for inclusion. And we actually encourage for that child to be in a regular classroom and participating in the process. And that is all part of that IEP. Going forward, and, and I think this is where um, the foundation and Patricia, I can't say enough about Patricia Levesque because they've been involved in all of these decisions. Right now what we're looking at in Florida is that we want a post-secondary option for a child with disabilities. In Florida, at the University of North Florida, at FIU down in South Florida, they have programs for uh, individuals with disabilities. We want to take that to the next level where you can say to a parent, a young parent that maybe is just learning that your child has a learning disability or whatever it may be, and we say if your child through the IEP process follows this path, that they will have a option at a university or a other vocation and in some capacity. We want that to be a partnership and uh, that's what we've tried to do in the state of Florida. It, it's been a journey and it continues to be a journey but I, what I, I do think what we're finding is is because of a lot of the good work that we've done early and technology has really changed it. Um, we were visiting about iPads. My son knows how to work the iPad better than I do. Um, he's Every morning he gets my iPad, goes on ESPN, checks the scores. That is the future to me for all kids, but especially kids with unique abilities. I mean, they just, they thrive on that technology. And the more that we can embrace that and we can provide a path for these, these children, then I think all states would be better. So uh, we're getting there, um, and we'll get into maybe some of the more details later, but um, 
so far we're, I, I think in Florida, we see an issue that needs to be addressed and, and I think we're heading in the right direction. So. Great, thank you so much, Senator. And we'll have questions at the end. But for right now, can we hear from Tennessee Commissioner Kevin Huffman? I think one of you may have to turn off. Let's see if that works. Yep. Hello. Oh, it is oh. Cool. maybe we just don't have the, we don't have the green light. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, hello everybody. Thanks for coming. I, so, a couple of things. One, just in terms of my personal interest in this subject, um, my brother growing up um, had learning disabilities and and received special education services the whole way through school. He was a year older than me, and and one of the things that always struck me as a child um, was that at home, outside of a labeled context, he was an incredibly brilliant, funny kid. And at school, in the context where at that time, um, special education really was a place rather than a service, he was treated completely differently by everybody, by teachers, by administrators, and by other kids as a result, because um, they took their cues from him. And the gulf between his abilities demonstrated outside of school and the way he was treated in school, um, I felt like was an incredible injustice. And it fueled my sense, um, uh, even before I was in education, of the extent to which we have a two-tiered system too often. Um, in, in my role in Tennessee, I've been focused um, on a lot of different kinds of reforms, and um, about 14% of our students are students with disabilities in Tennessee. Um, and while we've been focusing on lots of things, because we have lots of things that we need to do better, it became quickly apparent that one of our biggest deficit areas has been providing high quality special education services. And, and just before I run through a few of the things that we're taking on, um, I would say that one of the things that is obvious in education um, as a starting point is that the culture and the discussion of students with disabilities needs a lot of work. Um, it is, if you travel around um, schools, if you talk to people outside of education about education, this is not a Tennessee thing, this is all over, it's no longer socially acceptable to say bad things about poor kids or to say bad things about kids of a certain race. And even if people think it, they don't say it. It's astonishing to me how often people have said, um, things about students with disabilities that just outright imply low expectations for results and expectations that they are not going to be able to achieve at a high level and expectations that the adults responsible for serving them shouldn't feel a sense of accountability for ensuring that they could succeed at a high level. And it's spoken aloud in a way that it isn't when we talk about other kids. So I would say as a starting point, we have to, as adults, bring to the conversation a deep belief that students with disabilities can learn, that they can achieve, and that everybody who works in the system is responsible and accountable for that. And I say that not saying that, you know, um, that this is people in education versus people not in education. I think it's a broader societal thing, but it's something that we working in the system have a responsibility to take on as the conversation. We're just really getting started trying to take on some of the things within our system. So um, when I talk about some of the things we're doing, it's really things that we are uh, starting to do. So just a few things to run through them relatively quickly. One is improving the process for identifying students. You saw before the percentage of students with specific learning disabilities, which nationally, I guess, is around 36% according to the data, and it's nearly half in Tennessee uh, with a huge overrepresentation of minority students, especially minority male students. And one of the things that I think we've seen is that the over-identification of students results from um, kids coming to school behind and our identifying them then as students with disabilities 
and too often then treating special education as a place for them to go that becomes a hard place to get out of over the course of time. So we're putting a lot of focus on um, uh, an identification process through response to intervention that involves um, ensuring that we give all kids a universal screener and then that we start intervening with kids early who are the farthest behind. And if any of you came to the K-3 reading session in this room this morning, they talked about that in the reading context, but the, the idea is intervene with real support for kids who are farthest behind early on, well before you start thinking this is a student who needs special education services because we're identifying too many kids who the issue is not really a learning disability. The issue is um, a, a skills gap that we have the ability to address. So that's one huge initiative and it is, um, it's a massive undertaking to switch the way we do this in terms of training and in terms of even things for teachers like how you schedule the day and how many hours there are and the time availability for pullout. So I don't want to underestimate how hard it is to actually switch up the way schools are organized when you start talking about intervening with kids um, before you, you put them in special education. So that's one piece of it. The second is improving the access to a continuum of services and that's about both um, making sure that our interventions are appropriate, but then also on the IEPs, making sure that we are doing more to train teachers and schools to deliver IEPs better. Senator Gardner was talking about legislation around parental rights, which is really interesting, and I'm interested in hearing a lot more about that. And we've done training for the parent and advocacy community. We have a lot of great teachers and great principals who really want to do the right thing when it comes to IPs, and they've just not been appropriately trained over time to do it well. And so one thing is we just have to provide better and stronger training with clear expectations for what a good IEP looks like. Um, our assistant commissioner of special education has uh, a couple of students with disabilities who are receiving special education services. He was a special education teacher He's now the Assistant Commissioner of Education for Special Education. He tells me when he goes into an IEP meeting, he feels slightly intimidated by the process as a parent. And it's important to understand how challenging that is and that we need training on both sides of the equation for teachers and for parents. Um, third is doing more to provide access to both general education curriculum, which Senator Gardner talked about again, making sure that kids are actually in the regular education classroom more, but also assessments. So lots of states, states handle um, their assessments differently. Right now in this country, states uh, can exempt 1% of students from the state assessments, um, and they, they do a portfolio assessment. But states currently, and there's a rule in place that um, if it goes through will change this, states currently have the option of also exempting an additional 2% of students and putting them on alternative assessments. And, and most states do, some states don't. Tennessee has done that and over time because of poor guidance from the state, the percentage of kids taking these alternative assessments grew and grew and grew until we were way over the 2% cap and, and really it was our fault. It was the state level guidance that we were providing. But here's the rub on these alternative assessments. So the idea is that somehow that these are assessments that are similar to the regular state assessments but more accessible for students with disabilities. When we created a rule, we created a rule last year that um, if you had scored proficient or advanced on the alternative assessment the previous year, then you needed to move on to the general assessment. You couldn't stay on the alternative assessment. So the only students with disabilities who had been taking alternative assessments and were now taking traditional assessments had done well on the alternative assessments. 15% of those students scored proficient or advanced on the regular assessment, one five. So what that means is we were not telling the truth to parents. You know, we were telling parents, your, your child is proficient in fourth grade math. But when they took the real test, they weren't. And so that's a problem because then parents don't know that their students are behind. The teachers don't know that the students are behind. 
and nobody is taking the appropriate steps then to catch them up. So we actually moved about 10,000 students off of um, alternative assessments and onto traditional assessments, which I think is a painful but important step for us to take on. And then the last piece is thinking about how we, we take, um, how we include special education students in accountability. And this morning, again in the K-3 session, um, we heard that in Florida, when they added students with disabilities to their A to F school grading, that it was a sort of shock to the system. But then over the ensuing decade, scores for students with disabilities in Florida grew more than any other state in the country on NAEP. And I took real note of that because we are trying to hold schools and districts accountable right now for reducing the gap between students with disabilities and their peers. The other thing that we did that was a big deal, and, and I'll talk about this on this slide, we have an evaluation system, a teacher evaluation system that um, has been, it, this is our third year, it was very controversial as so we implemented it. I would argue that it has been maybe the biggest driver of positive student growth of anything that we've done in the state. Um, Tennessee had had value added scores for a while, but there was a law that exempted students with disabilities from value added scores. And um, our legislature took that on, actually our, our um, Senate education chair I see in the middle of the room, and um, we took that <laughs> on and, um, um, and passed the rule that reversed the exemption so that special education students are included in value added scores as they should be. Um, it both ensures that special education teachers more of them anyway, have a value added score, but also for the, the general education teacher, think of the message that we were sending when we said, you know, we're gonna evaluate you, you're gonna get a value added score, and those 17 kids are gonna count, but those five kids, they're not gonna count on your value added score. The message that it sends unmistakably signals that we don't think that the students are gonna do well, and we don't think that you need to be um, responsible for them. We also had run data before that then this is the data that, that came out afterwards that basically showed there's no difference in the range of distribution for uh, value added scores for special education students compared to any other group and I, I won't bother to over explain it but it is sort of what you would think. That's a range of distribution of scores high to low for special education um, uh, students and what you see is that, in fact, our students with disabilities are just as capable of learning and growing as any other group of students are. So it was really important to do that. And then um, I talked a little bit about this, but by next year we will be fully implemented in our response to instruction and intervention, which we think will improve our broader suite of services. So we have a long, long way to go, but um, I think we're starting to take some really important steps and grapple with the really important issues. Thank you so much. I'm dying to ask, start asking all of you follow-up questions, but we'll hear from Dr. Ladner first. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, let me just first agree with what Commissioner Huffman had to say about uh, I, my presentation will be fairly lighthearted here um, because you know, I like to reason through metaphor and whatnot, and it's the end of the day, and you guys have been wonked out a little bit, so I'm gonna have a little fun with this. But this is a deadly serious subject. You see the sort of remarks that Kevin referred to all the time. People openly say things. They say them in the press. They, I've seen statements in the Arizona Republic, like in, regarding A through F school grading in my state, where I live in Arizona, by the way. Um, you know, to the effect of, yeah, well, you know, the thing is about measuring growth, directly to your point, Kevin, you know, we have special ed kids and you can't really expect any growth there. I mean, that was actually printed in a newspaper, you know, and it's, it's a widespread phenomenon. It is something that we simply should not tolerate. Um, so having said that, <laughs> um, you're probably wondering why am I looking at a picture of Marty and Doc from Back to the Future? Well, um, I have a bit of an automotive theme to my presentation, but just stick with me and it'll eventually make sense. Um, <laughs> So how many of you remember seeing this? This is a statement made by a Silicon Valley mogul a, a while back. And 
He said, we were promised flying cars, and instead we got 140 characters. This is not fair. Like, why aren't things cooler than they are, right? And so, <clears throat> fair enough, I wanted a flying car too, right? But an economist recently said, you know, um, it was actually uh, Perry from the uh, AEI. He said, well, what's been going on with real cars? And if you look at the trends, they're startling positive, right? Average car lasts 37% longer these days just from where they were back in the late Clinton administration. If you look at average gas mileage, they doubled since the 1970s. Your chance of dying in a car has been profoundly slashed. Like, you know, I mean, it used to be pretty dangerous to drive around a car in the 1950s, and now your chances of dying are, you know, practically next to nothing. That's great. And then if you look at how much ca new cars cost relative to wages, the average well, well, hourly wage, the new car now costs about, you know, 70% less than it used to. Again, going back to is adjusting for inflation and all that kind of business, back to the late 1990s. Okay. So our cars aren't flying yet, but they're getting better all the time, right? Now, This book, and I put it up here just for the maze metaphor that was used. Um, when the first version of the IDEA Act passed the federal government, right, special education kids were promised what? An individual education plan. This was the foundation of federal law. And it is the case to this day that IDEA is a foundational piece of civil rights legislation. Uh, this is a book that was published in 2001. It was jointly published by the Thomas B. Fordham Foundation and the Progressive Policy Institute. So it was sort of left meets right, and uh, there was a broad discussion about IDEA and its problems. Now, everyone who signed on to this, this book agreed that, you know, look, IDEA is absolutely necessary, but there were a number of very vexing problems that were identified in the practice of special education in uh, the public school system. I think you could still say to this day that, that special education parents are probably the most frustrated group of parents in the public school system. And a theme across, there's a variety of the diversity of opinion, this is an edited volumes, a lot of people coming from different perspectives and whatnot, but kind of a common theme through all of this, that the IEP process, the promise of having an individualized education, had devolved into a process of bureaucratic compliance that was far more concerned with checking off boxes, uh, avoiding lawsuits uh, than it was with actual student outcomes, right? And that had been kind of the, the unfortunate. Uh, that's not to say that you know, anybody should be in favor of getting rid of IDEA, but reforming IDEA has been a fairly active topic since then. So as it turns out, um, the state of Florida took a, what I regard as an important step in the direction of fulfilling the promise of an individualized education. Um, now, uh, let me just flat out, right from the beginning, say that uh, I think school choice or parental options for special needs children are very important. They are not, however, a cure-all that's going to fix everything, that, that every problem that we have in the special education system. It's merely a portion of, of, a, of an improvement. It is not magic um, in and of itself. But part of what unfolded as Governor Bush uh, imp implemented his uh, reforms in Florida was actually a program, it's called the McKay Scholarship Program, uh, that was the nation's first school voucher program for students with disabilities. It was named after the uh, Florida uh, Senate president. It passed um, unanimously out of the Florida Senate. Uh, there were people who voted for the McKay Scholarship Program who had never voted for a school choice bill before, and some of them never voted for a school choice bill again, but they all voted for the McKay Scholarship Program. Um, and it was a first of its kind. Now, let me just mention that um, under IDEA, 2% uh, of the nation's school children have, have, for decades now, attended private schools at public school expense, okay, about 2% of the total nationwide. That has usually come about either through a process of an actual lawsuit that a parent um, you know, successfully files against a district for failure to provide a free and appropriate public education, FAPE for short, 
Um, or sometimes it's a consensual process where the district, the parents kind of say, yeah, you know, I did, you know, the child would be better off in, in a different setting. Sometimes it is the result of a threat of a possible lawsuit, but different ways to get there. And let me also just mention that my own mother was a special ed teacher, and, and I, I do understand this is very difficult work, okay? But um, the McKay program was the first of its kind. Um, it's up to about 20, it's getting on 27,000 students today, uh, about a little over half of which are uh, ethnic minorities. About 50% of the students in the program are free reduced lunch eligible. The average scholarship is around $7,000, but there's a very wide variation um, for children with multiple disabilities or the more profound disabilities, that number can get into the low 20s. Um, and let's see, I can't use my x-ray vision through Carla here. Uh, as you see, though, there's just the participating private schools. So, um, you know, in a variety of ways, this has been, uh, you know, an interesting experiment just from a broader debate about school choice. One of the things that gets sometimes brought up is this idea that, oh, well, you know, private schools only want to take the easy to educate kids. You know, they won't take the harder to educate kids. Basically, it turns out that, you know, I mean, if you have a well-designed program that's allowing the, the funding to follow, um, you get good participation. You get a lot of kids uh, benefiting. So, um, you know, you over a thousand private schools have kind of busted that myth. Now, if we look at the NAEP, um, you see very interesting variations in what is going on in terms of academic trends for special education students around the country. So a lot of states are making progress, and again, that gives lie to this sort of soft bigotry of low expectations, because we do see states making big progress, but we also see states that are making, going catastrophically in the wrong direction. So, this chart is only showing states um, uh, who have complied with NAEP's uh, inclusion standards, and I could go into the details on that, but uh, the, the short is, is in 2011, the NAEP put out explicit standards about, you know, you must include X percentage, I believe it was like 95% um, of special ed students, and there are some states um, who not only violate that standard, but actually do profound violence to that standard. There are a couple of states that don't test, for instance, in the 70% of their special needs kids. And you'll have to ask them why, I don't know, but they're not comparable to other states. But in any case, this is the combined NAEP gains between 2003 and 2011 on all four of the main NAEP tests, okay? So it's fourth grade math, fourth grade reading, eighth grade math, eighth grade reading, okay? And just as sort of a rule of thumb on the NAEP, um, a year's worth of academic progress is approximately worth 10 points, okay? So if I took a group of fifth graders and I gave them the fourth grade reading test, I would expect them to do about 10 points better than the fourth graders, okay? So what you see here is that Florida, I believe the exact number there on the top, I should have labeled it, was 54 points of academic gains across all four NAEP scores. So that's an average of about a grade level or a little more than a grade level's worth of progress per academic subject. Now some were a little bigger than others and that sort of thing. You also see the, the black column there is the national average, which is 18 points. So Florida made about three times as much progress as the national average. Way down there on the other end of the scale is South Carolina, where their special needs students dropped by 44 points across four tests, right? They're going in exactly the wrong direction. I, I don't know why that is, but if I were a South Carolinian, I'd be very, very concerned with that. So. Um, the program, the McKay program passed in, you know, in, in 1999, went statewide, and I believe in 2001. Um, I am not making any claim here that these gains are exclusively the province of the McKay Scholarship Program, because they're not, right? There were a lot of other policy changes made in Florida. Uh, Kevin mentioned one of them earlier, uh, the inclusion of special needs students in the AUF formula. If you look at the AUF formula and how it's calculated in Florida, you see there's a special emphasis on the gains of the kids who performed worse, the worst on the last year's test. They're sort of double weighted at, uh, of, of gains. Uh, there are other very, like the, the literacy program, the K3 reading program has been very beneficial to special needs students. 
So, you know, there's a variety of different policies going on. What we can say with certainty is, is that it's incredibly difficult to muster any evidence that special, the McKay Scholarship Program has done any harm to kids in the public schools with special needs. Okay, and in fact, we have research evidence showing the opposite. Uh, there's been some evaluations of participation in the McKay program and the number of private schools that are, that are in proximity to public schools that actually show that, that as options increase, so too do public school gains. Um, this is another chart that I think is interesting to put things into perspective. Um, another thing that you hear discussed often when there's a you know, choice program is, oh my God, everyone's gonna go rushing to the doors and there's gonna be the massive drain of students and et cetera. Um, this claim doesn't really hold up with, with special needs students because school districts have been informing us for the last 30 years that they don't receive enough money for special needs students, that they are forced to take money out of the general education programs and spend it on special ed, right? So to take an example, you might have a child who receives, say, $15,000 in state and federal funding, right? And the district's story consistently for the last three decades has been, yeah, but we spend 25. Right, you guys give us 15, but we spend 25, this is a hit, you need to give us more money. Okay, well, what if we have a program like McKay that basically allows these children to leave with their 15? Right, that's it, just take your 15 and, and, and find a situation that works for you. Uh, the districts really don't have a, a cause for, a, you know, a claim of harm in this, right? In fact, they could spend more money, they could still do that transfer to special ed and spend more money on the remaining special ed kids, or they can keep it back in general ed, either way, they're fine. But what we see here is that there is also no mad rush to the exits, okay? After a decade, what we see is about 5% of Florida students are directly making use of the McKay Scholarship Program to either go to another public or a private school, okay? It's 5%. Uh, my argument is, is that, um, you know, and as you can see, the total number of children in the Florida public school system that, that have disabilities has actually gone up. It hasn't even gone down. So. Um, it's my argument, though, that all children with disabilities in Florida have actually benefited from the McKay Scholarship Program simply because it was there if they needed it, okay? If you are in a situation where you're, you're, you're profoundly dissatisfied, having a hard time, right, if you want to utilize the program, everyone knows it exists, and that changes the relationship between a parent and the school district, right? Just the fact that it's there. Uh, is, is, is literally empowering in, in a very profound way. This is a map of the country that shows other states that have taking, taken measures to provide more choices for special needs students. I have South Carolina there because they passed a tax credit program. Uh, most of those states have pursued choice for special needs students through a voucher mechanism. And Arizona has done something different. So. I like to say Arizona has sort of taken the next step. Um, we've taken the McKay Scholarship Program and, and done something different with it, and I think this is where we're getting into uh, the flying cars category, okay? What is the way of the future? How can we actually provide a customized education for a special needs child, right? Uh, I believe that that fundamentally ought to include the ability to choose who provides services to your child. And I actually believe that you can't really have an individualized education plan unless you have that power, right? Unless I can pick who provides what kind of services, right? I'm not really in charge. And the, the education you get may, not, may or may not be individualized, okay? So we have a new program. It's only three years old in Arizona. It's called the Empowerment Account Scholarship, ESA program for short. And basically this is, rather than a scholarship or a voucher or let's call it a coupon, right, that I can use to take you know, from my child from school A to school B. This is at a deeper level where parents actually get an account that they access through a debit card, right? And there are restricted uses that can be used with this account, um, but you know you can use it for private school tuition. You can use it for a la carte public school courses. You can use it for online programs. Um, you can use it for certified private therapists. Um, there are a number of you know a number of, of uses, but you know ultimately it's a finite number of uses. And one of the uses is, is that if there are funds remaining, you can actually put them in a Coverdale savings account for future higher ed use, okay? And also along the way, if you want, um, um, 
and it's appropriate you can choose to send your child to a junior college or a university actually okay so the idea is is that we want to have as many choices available as possible okay and what we're really kind of aiming for here is not just school choice right school choice is like this school or that school right with a program with this much flexibility, now you're getting down to education choice. What are the best methods that I can use to meet my child's particular needs? That may be involving going you know, to a full-time school. It may involve more of an a la carte approach, uh, but it ultimately winds up being very customized. This is one of our students in the Arizona ESA program. His name is Jordan Visser, and he has multiple disabilities, a cerebral palsy, um, he also suffers from dyslexia and uh, is visually impaired. And um, Jordan uh, is one of the, I mean, this is a very small program. It remains under legal assault. There's currently like 761 kids in this program in Arizona. But if you, you know, uh, Jordan has been, and his parents have been interviewed and profiled. And Jordan is being educated um, at home with private tutors. Um, he has a tutor who is specialized in teaching children with visual impairments uh, reading. Um, and uh, she reports that you know Jordan would become incredibly frustrated in school. Uh, when she started with him, he had five sight words, you know, words that he could instantly recognize it on sight. Um, he's up to about 100 now. Uh, his parents were able to double the amount of physical therapy that he gets. Um, he's a, he has uh, challenges with balance and, and whatnot, and is, you know, he's getting twice as much physical therapy as before. And he's even getting specialized uh, balance therapy that involves you know, certified therapists and um, horseback riding. Right, um, you know, you can't use these funds for, for just you know, anyone off the street. You have to be a certified uh, uh, therapist. And, um, horseback riding apparently is helping Jordan to be able to walk. Um, Jordan's father said, you know, the way he described his overall experiences is that he said, look, the school, meaning the school that Jordan had been at, the school had a job and it had defined roles and they were carrying out those roles to the best of their ability. Okay. He said, you know, the school were not advocates for Jordan the way that we, meaning he and his wife, were advocates for Jordan, okay? So his parents are basically, you know, selecting from a wide universe of providers, service providers, to try to give Jordan exactly what he needs. And he's doing, they're able to do this for literally what is 90% of the funding that would have gone to Jordan's school. Now this is not an option that is for everyone. It's really not, right? But for the kids that want it, desire it, and, and can use it, it can be a godsend. Again, this is not a cure-all for everything that's wrong in the, in, in the special ed system, uh, but it is a big step in the right direction, especially for Jordan. So um, I mentioned that this is access through debit cards. We have to be very mindful and have been vigilant about creating uh, provisions to prevent misuse of funds. The debit card mechanism is actually the technology that allows us to do this. Uh, there are codes that you can access to, to, act, to deny access to vendors. You can't take this card, for instance, and go buy you know, poker chips at a casino. It's not on the allowed list. This is all you know, monitored by the state carefully. There's constant uh, examination of accounts, but literally you can't go to buy anything there because, uh, because it's not on the allowed list and it, it can only be used for the things that it's supposed to be used on. So, in general, what I, I hope to see is that parental choice can play a role in kind of updating our car from something that, you know, looks a little bit too much like this to something that looks like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to questions. If you have one, come on up, and I'm gonna go ahead and pose a question to Senator Gardner to get us started. One of the things that stood out to me in doing my research was the vote count on your bill. And given some of the very progressive reforms in there, I'm wondering, one, how the politics worked out, how you got those votes, and was there substantial pushback from the education community? Um, I think initially, uh, there, initially there was some pushback. And I, I think ultimately when they saw the members that that it was really starting to to gain momentum uh the president of the florida senate president don gates 
uh, was 110% on board. Speaker Weatherford, who's a very good friend, was also very supportive. So I think once that started, it, it really kind of slowed down the, the local school districts. Now, however, since we've made that change, there have been some situations where the law was going to go into effect on July 1. Uh, school districts, one particular one, what we've heard is actually moved the IEP process up prior to July 1 to try to avoid um, the empowerment of the parent. And we've had a couple other situations also in that bill. It allows for a parent with con consultation for the te with the teacher to bring in therapists into the classroom, private therapists to actually work with the child. That was unique. And uh, as much as we would have liked to say, well, that school and that teacher has to have the therapist come in if the parent wants it, we really wanted a situation where the, the, the teacher was working with the parent on what's the most appropriate thing to keep that child in the classroom. That's what we ultimately were after was we have a definition of inclusion. It's more than just PE. What will help that child be in the classroom? And we haven't had any situations yet where um, a teacher has said, no, I don't want any therapists in my class. The good thing about Florida, we meet once a year for 60 days, and certainly it's something that we're going to consider. I do want to touch on one thing uh, just real quick. On the dialogue and the, the terms used, I can't say it enough how important that change is. And, and we've seen some changes since I was young. You know, we all know the, uh, the terms that are, that are so hurtful that can be used. In Florida last year, we actually removed the term retardation from the Florida statutes completely. It's just gone. We don't use it anymore. Um, and if my wife were here, she would tell you the one thing that just makes her cringe is <coughs> when we talk about a child with autism, apparently it's appropriate to say an autistic child or a Down syndrome child. You know, these are children first <coughs> and foremost. You know, we don't say cancer kids. We say a child with, with cancer. And just that, that change in how we react and, and just understanding that first and foremost they're, they're a child, that, change, that starts to change that dialogue of what truly is inclusion <coughs> moving forward. Thank you very much. I concur wholeheartedly with your wife, by the way. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, th oh, we have a question. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Sarah with School of Choice Ohio. I appreciate all of your comments, and we're struggling with some of these issues we hear a lot from parents. One of the things we hear about from parents is this kind of approach to fail first, and then we'll see, then we'll get them the services. And I wonder if, you know, parents feel they have to go through this year of knowing that their child is not getting the services, that they're not being reached. I wonder if any of you have experience or have observed other approaches that are working better. So with our response to intervention and instruction, um, you don't have to go through a year and you can bypass the process by asking for an IEP meeting and we're trying to train parents in understanding when they can jump in and of course there are parents and children for whom it doesn't make sense to try an additional intervention. We know what the issue is. It's time to start getting them services. So we've got the safety net for that and it's really a question of whether we train people effectively including parents in the advocacy community on that. So I don't think that needs to be a barrier. What we found though is that that argument has been a barrier to trying to get people to embrace the idea that we need to actually provide real meaningful intervention for kids who are behind. And so we've got to address it, make sure everybody understands it, but then we just believe so profoundly that for, for kids who identify with specific learning disabilities, um, we have to first try to figure out whether they are simply behind and have not received excellent instruction and through receiving instru excellent instruction have a chance to catch up and then potentially not be diagnosed with a learning disability if it's inappropriate. But you've got to have an out or a safety net or it, it kills the entire conversation and can be harmful. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, I'm Tom Arnett from the Clayton Christensen Institute. And I'm curious to hear your perspectives on the role that technology-enabled personalized learning can have in assisting with special, special education. Um, to give a little background um, to the comment, some of the comments that Mr. Lander made, 
you know, often special education can be so expensive to, to really do with fidelity that it turns into more of a compliance thing than an actual um, effort to serve kids the way they need to be served. Um, now contrast that with, in our research, we've seen schools that are kind of at the forefront of innovation right now um, cr creating learning environments and learning models where every single student can learn at their own, uh, at their own pace through their own individualized learning path. And so it seems like there's potential that these technologies cannot, you know, if they can serve all students with an individualized learning plan, they can definitely benefit students with, um, with special needs. Um, in addition to that, um, to Commissioner Huffman's comments about the stigma that can be associated with special, special education, I think if you've got a situation or a classroom or a school where all the students are getting individualized education, it kind of takes away that stigma of having individualized education plans for students with special needs. So curious to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. I just, uh, and I, I touched on it earlier, I, for any individual, I just think the future is technology. And, and, you know, in a perfect world, I've got a couple more years left in the Senate, but you know, there's different levels of disability. And, you know, we have the, maybe it's just a reading disability. Uh, in, in some cases, you know, upon birth, what the disability is going to be. And what we would like to see is essentially you create an app for the parent that they can download and they can enter in their zip code and where they live and all the options are available. You know, the, this Arizona plan is something I'm interested in and the parent is empowered because that, that's really the problem, at least for you know, the diagnosed disability early. It, it's just overwhelming. You have no idea. But for technology, I think online learning, uh, the, the ability uh, for, the, for a child to be involved in that is really the future. Um, and we were talking about if you have a child that's maybe nonverbal, there was a story in Orlando where they gave the child an iPad, and the parents were surprised what the child could do on the iPad and what they were, and what their interest was. You know, and we spend so much time, and I know handwriting is important, but it may not be the most important thing for that child with with a certain disability. But learning on, on through technology is, and and that's kind of the future, and it's something that um, I certainly think is 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 what we're interested in here in Florida. I think a great example of this is, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but I, there was an ABC News uh, story about him done on a couple years ago. There was an organization called Rethink Autism. Are you, are you familiar with them? No, I haven't heard of them. So this is not my area of special, you know, specialization, but um, the basic idea behind the organization was is that there's a, a, a type of therapy for um, autism called, I think it's called Applied Behavioral Analysis. And the bottom line on this is that, that there is a shortage of people in the United States who know how to do this and do it well. And they tend to be clustered in high income areas on the coast. So if you happen to live in the Midwest or you live in a, mid, a rural area or whatever, you're kind of out of luck. I mean, literally families would have to like move across the country to get this type uh, uh, of therapy. And if you did it privately, it was profoundly expensive. So the basic idea behind Rethink Autism was is that it is literally an online program, a platform with videos that essentially trains parents how to do this type of therapy themselves, okay? And it's a classic disruption story, right? Because, um, you know, if you're, if you're bleeding out as a soldier and, you know, somewhere on the rocks in Afghanistan, right, your first choice might be, wow, I wish I was in John Hopkins Hospital right now, right? but a field medic sounds really great about now, right? I will settle for a field medic if that's what's gonna keep me alive, right? Um, and so basically, as I understand, and this is not my area of expertise, but as I understand it, this, this program has a fairly low monthly subscription rate or something, I think, if I remember correctly, it was 10 or $20 a month, something like that, okay? So something that was easily affordable and uh, would teach you how to do this on your own. And this is, you know, otherwise this is a service that simply may not be available to you at all. And apparently it makes a profound difference in the life of these children, okay? Well, as you watch the ABC story, of course, what's the next thing that's gonna happen, right? It's the people that already are specialized in this going, oh, no, 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 not at all. No, you can't do that, blah, blah, blah. You have to come to me and blah, you know, that tip, the typical type of, uh, of, of thing. I think 
the, that sort of innovation has profound possibilities to improve the life of children with disabilities and in ways that right now we can scarcely imagine where what you know what will we see two years five years ten years down the road right um you know maybe rethink autism is a great success maybe it fails and something else comes along right um but i think that that it's a general proposition in, in education, in my opinion, that the kids who are doing doing the worst now have the most to gain from from innovation. And I hope that we will see a healthy embrace of it, such that you know we get that kind of innovation because the, these these kids are the ones that really need it the most. Thanks, Matt. I could spend um, an entire session on the subjects. I feel so passionately about it. And it's interesting to me because the bulk of the research in technology and special ed seems to be focused on autism type therapies and speech and behavioral issues, which I think is fantastic and I don't want to diminish it at all. In fact, I was touring a school district in southern Arizona recently and they showed me a child who had been completely nonverbal her whole life but had an iPad and how it had transformed her life, which is, but the interesting part of the story to me was she had um, an AAC device, what they call them, and it was this $15,000 big black box, but she never wanted to use it because it was big, heavy, ugly. She has an iPad, now she's cool. The kids are jealous of her because she's got an iPad, so even that part of it was interesting to me. But aside from just the speech and behavioral, I do feel like in a way we're still missing the boat in how technology can be used to increase academic achievement for students in special ed, how to learn math and reading. Again, speech and behavioral issues, that's great, and I'm all for that, but making sure that, because if they can't express everything that they know, especially in reading and math, iPad just opens up limitless opportunities. Great, right, thank you. Hi, I'm Representative Maddie Daughtry from Maine, and Senator Gardner, I wanted to commend you on taking the word re retardation out of Florida statute. I used to work with VSA Arts of Maine and um, trying to make kids realize that that word can have such a stigma was a huge movement of ours. But um, my question is, for students with disabilities who take a voucher, who go to another school, how, as legislators, do we track their movement? How do we make sure they're getting the care the education and the services they need. So how do we have that type of, you know, making sure they get what they need but still having an individualized plan? Yeah, it's a very uh, important question. Um, you know, it's um, one of the things for us as you'll often hear raised an objection to a program like this is that, that if you go, then you're going to be leaving, you know, um, your federal IEP rights behind back mm -hmm. in the public school, and this private school is not subject to those. And you know, now of course, private schools are subject to separate uh, special education uh, legislation from IDEA, but IDEA um, is for the public school system. So it does require parents to basically uh, to to make a decision and to take a leap. Uh, for instance. The reason why this can work in the first place, right, is if you think back to the 15 and 25,000 example I gave earlier, mm -hmm. I mean, the reason why we can see the McKay Scholarship Program with 26,000 kids in it, and there's been surveys done of parental satisfaction that are very high level. Um, one of those surveys actually found that, um, I mean, the, across the board, you know, the, the children being less bullied, uh, better academic progress, at least perceived by the parent, you know, across a whole range of things that are higher parental satisfaction. Uh, this survey actually surveyed the parents who were no longer in the McKay program. Okay, so these are parents who maybe they went to, they, they tried a private school and had a bad experience and left. Or they could have moved to a different part of the state or out of the state, right? And they, they you know, they're no longer in the McKay scholarship program. Uh, but of a, of a universe of people that you would expect to have unpleasant things to say about them in the McKay Scholarship Program, 92% of them agree that the McKay Scholarship Program was a good thing and should continue. <laughs> okay, so that, I mean that's a really powerful endorsement. But um, basically, what happens is is the parents have to go and work out a plan of education with the private provider on their own. Right, the reason why it works. Is because you know why can you take a fifteen thousand dollars scholarship and you know at twenty five and get happier parents? Well, a part of this is some of the dysfunctionality of the IDEA legislation itself, which the public schools complain about bitterly, as you would be aware. Um, 
you know, it is a leap of faith that parents are required to, you know, develop these plans with the private providers themselves, but it is not compliance based and rule bound the way it would be in the public school system. If you want that, you can stay in the public school system. In fact, you can even use a McKay scholarship to go to a different public school, okay? Um, to some extent, if you choose that private option, then you are taking upon yourself the responsibility to work out the plan that you want with, uh, with your um, uh, provider. Um, these programs typically do not include provisions for standardized testing. And um, I will be the first to say that I actually don't agree with that. Um, I think there should be um, uh, systems put in place to provide some academic transparency for children who participate in these programs. I think that that has to be carefully thought out in terms of balancing the public's interest in, um, in transparency with the, an interest in preserving the independence of private schools. Um, I, I think. That, that other programs outside special needs programs have done this successfully by adopting uh, a requirement for uh, national reference tests. It's more respectful of the curriculum choices of the private schools. It basically gives us the information that we need. Um, and this is a, a deficit, in my opinion, in the special needs programs around the country is that they typically get passed without a requirement that that be done. And my personal opinion is, is that it's an improvement if, if we can get them to adopt them. So. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. If I could just add to that real quick, the one thing about the McKay scholarship is there's a one-year requirement in the public school system before you're eligible for McKay. So everybody kind of knows what the, the child's achievement situation was because they were in, in the public school. We did actually make a change a couple of years ago that a parent or a family that's in a preschool, VPK is what we call it, can transition directly into McKay. So they could bypass that one year. Everybody agrees that a private school or another location is better, then they can just transition right in. And, and so far, that the one year requirement is one that always is a, a lot of discussion with parents is, do I have to do the one year? because I know it, everybody agrees it's not getting better and they eventually are gonna take the McKay scholarship. And that's something we continue to struggle with, you know, um, and, and we'll probably will continue to talk about that. Thank you. Uh, the, oh, there are, can you there, repeat the question so everybody here? Oh, sure, yeah, he asked um, how we determine eligibility for the Arizona program. Uh, it's set down in statute. It started as exclusively as a special needs program. It actually replaced a voucher program that we had for special needs students that was struck down by the Arizona Supreme Court. Um, and the, the court in its decision uh, basically said, look, we have a Blaine Amendment in our Constitution. And uh, the court basically said, you know, look, there's only one way you can use this scholarship and that's go to a private school and that's forbidden by the, by the Arizona court uh, by the Arizona Constitution. We didn't agree with that decision, but that was, they made it was a unanimous decision, five to nothing. They did, however, suggest, you know, if there were other ways you could use this money, you know, if it wasn't just the only thing that you could do, it would be go to a private school, it might be constitutional. So um, that is being litigated right now. It, uh, we just got an appeals court decision like a week or two ago that was very favorable, but we'll see how it ultimately plays out. Um, subsequent to that, um, statewide children who are attending D and F rated public schools, uh, children that have been through the foster care system, um, and uh, the children of military dependents are eligible. So statewide, the eligibility pool is about 20% of, of the students in Arizona. Um, the awareness of the program is very low, participation rate is low, but the, the eligibility is defined in statute. Yes, they have funded eligibility. If they want to participate in the program, they just have to go through the process, apply to the state, and they get their account. Yes. Did you have a question? Yes. Hi, I'm Lauren Kianasi. I'm a grassroots organizer with the Foundation for Florida's Future, which is the Florida Division of the Foundation for Excellence in Education, and I've had the pleasure of working with Senator Gardner and his wife um, on uh, helping parents understand their new rights under the bill. And so I would love to hear a little bit more, you, and, and many of you mentioned the idea of 
um, engaging parents and educating parents. And, and I think you said um, that Parents of students with special needs are often the most frustrated, but I find in my work as a grassroots organizer, they are also some of the most engaged. And so um, could you talk a little bit more about how do we can engage them in these policies and how can we um, do a better job of educating them about their rights? Well, I, I can just say briefly in Tennessee that the having an assistant commissioner in charge who is himself a parent who's a member of that advocacy community makes a big difference but he um, uh, has worked with the formal advocacy communities to set up meetings around the state and encourage them to invite parents um, to the meetings which is an important step I, I would say a precursor even to that step is believing that it's a good thing to have parents engaged in the process um, I don't know that that's necessarily a shared vision that it's a good thing. I think sometimes parents, having parents engage in the process is not viewed as a good thing. And so um, I think starting with the belief that we want parents engaged in this process is going to make the process better, it's what's fair, it's what's right, and then working through the advocacy community. I think the challenge is, you know, with all grassroots organizing is, um, at least from the state level, it's really hard to get to everybody and so you do what you can through the advocacy communities and then work with the school districts who ultimately need to be communicating with parents um, themselves but that's the the hard piece is it's an active community but it's not everybody yeah and, and just to, along those same lines I I joke you know at, at night I'm usually flipping channels watching ESPN or something and my wife who started the Down Syndrome Foundation of Florida her it seems like every time somebody calls her first thing is well they can't do that they can't <laughs> do that and, and people will ask her about the legislation and some of the other things that we've we've done it, it really is about communicating the new process in Florida and we've had some discussions with the Department of Education that when we make significant changes that the parents that are going through an IEP are actually notified. Don't rely on the school district. Don't rely on, on word of mouth. You know, we, we do it through our uh, websites, but actually send them a letter and say, here's what's changed when you go into that IEP process. And so we're still kind of working through that. Um, but you're right, it's amazing how many things we've done that, that parents just ultimately just haven't heard about yet and it takes a little bit of time it's encouraging though to get that phone call from a parent to say it's changed you know the way the kids are handled has changed since we've said you put in law you know regardless what happens with that IEP that mom or dad has to sign I totally agree we're all on board that's huge so. one of the things I would love to see start changing and it's along the lines of what Senator Gardner talked about what we call people first language, that you're a child with autism, not an autistic child, but really in the same way in education. So it's not just education and special eds over here and afterthought, but that they're students first. So even as we close out now, I would challenge all of us as we're thinking about implementing digital technology, as we're implementing new standards, assessments, thinking about accountability, evaluation systems, that they're always part of that, that conversation, that it's not an afterthought. So I think that will also go far with parents, because a lot of parents with special needs kids have typically developing children in the same way, so they're receiving almost different kinds of messages, rather than really being inclusive, even in terms of how we communicate that. Um, I think about an anecdotal story I have just from a couple weeks ago. Arizona has K-3, the Florida kind of K-3 reading legislation, and we did an IEP exemption a couple years ago. Personally, of course, I don't think we should hold back a child with an IEP if they're not reading by third grade. So in some ways that was right, but it's the message that we sent, like Kevin was talking about, um, by not having anything else in place. If not, then by when? Are we monitoring progress? Are we expecting more? So I get a call from a friend of mine who's the head of our local Down syndrome organization. Her, child, her son's in third grade. And she just says, why does my son not have to learn how to read? I said, I what do you mean? Well, the school just told me that he's not required to read by third grade. So, of course, I walked her through the legislation and, you know, why that was the case, and we certainly didn't want to hold him back, but it's the message that that sends to parents that it's just different special eds over here. 
So again, I would challenge us all to think as we're thinking about all the great things that Governor Bush is talking about and doing, how to make sure that we're being fully inclusive in policy and in implementation and language as well. Do we have any other questions? Any closing thoughts, panelists? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> well, you're a senator, you can do that. Hello, my name is Bill Galvano. I have the pleasure of serving with Senator Gardner in the Florida Senate. Uh, my question is this for everybody, and something that Senator Gardner touched on at the very beginning, and that's that transition to higher education. And, and what, what can we, we envision in that regard, at, especially when we look at inclusion for special needs students as they make that transition? And, and what are your, your long-term thoughts in that regard? I would also just say that in on our State Developmental Disability Council, we came up with three priorities, and priority number one was employment. And my argument as a member of that commission was you can't have a strategy on employment if you don't have a strategy on post-secondary education. The same you would with the rest of the world, that that's got to be a part of the conversation and a part of the plan if we're going to really make um, significant impacts in employment. So I would also shift that conversation a little bit to an employment focus. Yeah, and um, I, I actually believe that the after high school time is going to be our next big debate. I mean, because we have all these great programs. McKay Scholarship has been widely successful. And we've actually looked at expanding it and have started to touch on it a little bit where a, a, an individual could use the McKay Scholarship for a post-secondary education platform. but. What's going to happen and what we are seeing happen is we've had all these great programs and then the child has handed a diploma that they just don't have an option. You know, there's not been a path that has been created for them. And I think you're going to see in Florida, we actually have a, have a, a group put together and Senator Galvano is chair of the Appropriations Committee. They funded it and it is university leaders, it's uh, advocates. And what it is is to sit down and talk about what type of diploma are we giving these, these children and can it be used for anything? And, and that's the big struggle. All of the things that we've done in Florida, and I was mentioning this to Governor Bush last night, the special diploma, nobody's changed it since the early 1970s. That, I mean, that tells you a lot that that is the area. And again, my issue is, when a parent is faced with that challenge, whatever that challenge may be, that at least in the state of Florida, we hand that, that family a playbook and we say, here are all the options for your child. Here are the, you got this type of diploma, you got this, you got this, and if you hit this, you can go to this university or college and get a vocation and go get a job and live independently. Um, and I don't I mean to take up all of it, but on the second piece for us, it wasn't just education, but we're actually starting to really push for housing, funding for housing for individuals with disabilities. And, uh, and, and there's, that, that'll be some other time, but that, that's really the future for us. And, you know, Sarah Galvano touched on it, but if I'm not involved in it, when you all get together again, that will continue to be an issue is what do we do after high school? Yeah, I mean, just the one thing I would add to that very quickly is, is that, that you know, um, one question that would come up often in Arizona as we looked at Florida's model, um, a little off subject, but kind of related, was that they said, well, what did they do special about ELL? How do those ELL scores go up so much, right? What, what's the secret magic wand to, to, to throw at this, right? And then, you know, when I posed this question to Patricia, the answer was we taught them how to read, right? When you see the trends, um, you know, sort of what Patricia calls the Bush babies as they graduated out of elementary in the middle school, right? When did the graduation, high school graduation rate start to go up? When the Bush babies got there? When did the college attendance rate start to go up? when the Bush babies got there, you know. So the most, and there's a lot of other issues, a lot of higher ed issues is very complex, right? But the most important thing is to get the basics right from the very beginning, right? You get the basics right, more of those kids are gonna wind up going to college because they have the necessary skills to do so. So the first thing we need to do is not shortchange them in K-12. Absolutely. You know, one of the, th the reasons I found uh, Senator Gardner's bill so compelling was that 
um, concrete decision that parents had to agree on standards and assessment because so often parents are being asked to make decisions. The IEP process is so overwhelming as it is. Most parents don't even know what a standard is, let alone an alternative one. But as early as kindergarten, they're deciding whether they're gonna be on the alternative test kind of track. And again, an anecdotal story, I met a mom at a conference last year, and I don't know what state she was from, but if your child is on an, the 1% track or the alternative testing track, you're statutorily prohibited from getting a diploma. And her comment to me was, my son is condemned to a life of poverty, can never apply for a job, can't pursue higher ed, and she made that decision, you know, kindergarten, first grade, and had no idea what that long-term effect of that decision was gonna be on his life. Yep, I think we're about ready. Thank you so much for sticking with us on this long day.